What's up, grappling fans? Welcome back to another episode of The Grappling Bulletin. Right here, a full grappling podcast hosted by myself, Howell Teague, and my co-host, my buddy, my partner in crime, Chasey Smith. What's, What's up? up, guys? Uh, well, we're still here. We made it through the ice apocalypse, snowmageddon. You guys may have seen some of that. We're based, of course, in Austin, Texas, and interesting week last week, but I'm very happy to be back on the grind. Yeah, sorry for no show last week. We were all set to go. Like, and then <laughs> Sunday night, this crazy ice storm hits. We lose power for like four days. We were basically, we were pretty much left homeless. We were refugees camping in various places around the city. And it was not a lot of fun. So apologies if we were uh, unable to bring our regular weekly show. But we're back. We're back. And it's like we've never been away. Mm. Because, man... Other, uh, we unfortunately were cut off from everything, but the jujitsu world kept rolling. Oh yeah, the show must go on, and uh, Fight to Win delivered quite the show. Fight to Win one sixty four. We of course saw uh, Wagner Hosha take on Yuri Samoyes. Crazy matchup, just in theory. You know, va- you don't think of Wagner and Yuri being in the same weight class, and they're not really. Yeah, absolutely and, uh, not. <laughs> so to see that unfold was was pretty wild. How. Yeah, this was great. So let's kick off the show with uh, a little breakdown of the uh, you know the main event from Fight to Win 164 last weekend. It was Wagner Hosha versus Yuri Samoyes. And we've got a, a little highlight video we can play while we're talking about this. So Wagner Hosha, eight years younger, 30 pounds, sorry, eight years older, 30 pounds lighter, comes out and takes on the two-time ADCC champion, Yuri Samoyes. Now, Yuri Samoyes, you know, we haven't seen a lot from him in terms of grappling in the last year and a half or so. He's only had one grappling match in that Mm. time, a gi match. That was very recently. But the rest of the time, he's concentrating on, you know, fighting MMA. So let's not forget, though, that Yuri was a champion in 2015 and 2017 in two different divisions. Now, Wagner has never won gold at ADCC. He's come close, right? Yeah, of course, two times, or no, silver medalist most recently, then of course a bronze medalist before that, multi-year veteran, multiple time trials winner. Um, and really, you could say has reached the peak of his career right now. I mean, he's never looked better, Hal. He has not, that is true. The last couple of uh, months for Wagner have been very impressive. You know, in that time, and we talked about this in the preview to the show, but he's taken on, and now he's beaten two former ADCC champions. He has a win over Shanji Hibero. Excuse me, that was a draw, technically. But he had a, a very convincing performance against Shanji Hibero. He heel-hooked Gabriel Almeida. He had a decision win against John Blank. And now he has this decision win against Yuri Samoyes. Those are four opponents significantly bigger and heavier than Wagner you know, is, is used to competing against. So for me, the performance says a lot because Yuri was not able to take Wagner down. And when Yuri was on bottom here, because it was Yuri who elected to pull guard, he's mm-hmm. like, man, I know I'm going to get on bottom. He's, he's going after Wagner's legs. Wagner shut it down. Yeah, you can see Wagner looks very comfortable here on top, even going for his own kind of a steam and lock style uh, attack there. Uh, Wagner has one of the most impressive bases, I would say, in the game, especially Nogi. He's really good at his own style of float passing and uh, really just remains out of danger. And you can see Yuri's really hunting for the legs. I really liked, actually, Yuri's bottom game here. Uh, Some creative attacks. You can tell he's really been kind of trying some new things out there. But Wagner was unfazed by all of that and just sort of, I would say, imposed the pace, which may have been a decisive factor here. Yeah, and, and, you know, a a really important thing to mention in this match as well is that it got a little bit chippy at times, you know? (laughs) As as matches with Wagner do. As matches with Yuri can as well, because (laughs) Yuri is not exactly the most, uh, you know, easy goal. Look at that hand in the mouth, though. I mean, just, yeah. That's classic Wagner, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, there was some heavy collar ties. I mean, at one point, like, Yuri literally swings like a hook, and Wagner ducks like, 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 literally like a boxer, you know? And uh, a unanimous decision, though, in favor of Wagner. And, um, I'll be I, honest. I, I was it... surprised that it was unanimous. I thought it was a really, really close match. I thought Yuri had some attacks as well. Mm-hmm. I just think when you when you see a unanimous decision, usually it's pretty decisive. And I would say eh, there was some room for interpretation there. But either way, strong showing from either. And the question for, for me now is, where does Wagner go next? Yeah, really good question. Because... Uh, you know, uh, he's already talked about how this extra weight on his frame, he feels that his jujitsu is better as a result. And the results speak for themselves. Mm. You know, you look at his performances in the last couple of months, he's doing great. So when ADCC does come back around, is he going to cut back down to 77 or, you know, is 88 in his future? 
Personally, I feel that eighty eight might be the move, but of course, ADCC is so far away. Well, there's a lot of time in between now and then, and you know, with Wagner, thirty eight years of age, clock is ticking on a career. You know, of course, him and Cyborg, those guys are just best examples. <laughs> I of think it's older spinning grapplers. the other way. The clock is going in reverse because both those guys just keep getting better. So I don't know. Never count them out. They bucked the trend for sure. But the thing is, you know, there will come a point where they're not able to compete as they used to. So they got to make the most of it now while they can, while they've got this momentum going. So uh, I, I expect to see Wagner back soon, but who you know? Face off, or face off against remains to be seen. Absolutely, but yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, that match really good, and uh, I think definitely worth a watch. You know, the, the highlight kind of like teases a little bit, but go and go and check out the full thing. But fight to win. So fight to win 164 was a uh, typical fight to win, as you can expect, loaded with talent from top to bottom. There are a number of uh, notable results, but I think the one we should dive in first in our fight to win 164 recap was Dante Leon versus Manuel Hibamar, co-main event. Yeah, you said chippy earlier. Well, this match was also chippy, but maybe not as much as the response to the results. So by, by now, many of you may have heard that Manuel Hibamar won the uh, decision victory there. A lot of people thought it went the other way. Let's go ahead and run sort of the highlights here. You can get a, a feel for the vibe of the match and how it played out. But how? What, what are your thoughts? What are your takeaways from this? Well, first off, you were right. that This match result really divided opinion. The Instagram comments particularly were... Uh, heavily in favor of Dante, and uh, many of them saying that they felt that he was robbed. Now, I'm not going to sort of speak that um, harshly as to the, the results. You know, I think any time that you let the match go the distance, or you don't finish it, then you have to be prepared that the judges didn't see the match the way that you felt it went. And this is one of the moments that the judges were obviously looking at, because in fight to win rules, the submission counts above everything else. So all of Dante's wrestling attacks, all of his uh, his guard pulls, all of his attack, all of his takedowns, they're outweighed by those submission attacks. But under fight to win rules criteria, submission attacks being more important than anything else, well, I count Dante having two strong submission attacks where I have Hibamar with just the one. So you saw Hibamar and Dante, they traded guillotines earlier in that little clip there. And then later, towards the end of this match, Dante finishes the bout on Hibamar's neck. And you'll see it just as we count down the clock now. Boom. Last second. I counted a solid two to three seconds there with Dante on Hibamar's neck before the time ran out. So split decision. Two of the three judges gave it to Hibamar. And, you know, Dante, well, you saw the way he threw his arms up. He was not happy with that. Yeah, he was frustrated with the results. And um, it's an interesting view into maybe being the, uh, into the psychology of a ref or a judge. For example, Hivamar got his guillotine attempt off first. Now, we often hear the phrase stealing a round in MMA where you have the last sort of significant movement at the end of a round. But maybe Hivamar leading may have been enough of an influence if he got it off first. I don't really know. I think the math is pretty basic. Dante did seem to have more, but um it's it's really in the eye of the beholder and you're not when you're not math side right? it's 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 hard to really uh, make a critical assessment when you're not on the mat. Because those judges have to decide how close, how effective, how mm. dangerous they thought those submission attacks were. So, you know, what we see on the video is one thing. But when you're next to two competitors on the mat, you can see and hear things that we can't. Mm. You can see the hand placement under the chin. You can see the, 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 the veins bulging in somebody's face. You can see the color of their face changing. You can hear them gurgling and choking. So maybe they were privy to information that we weren't. But yeah, you're right. You know, the, it, it, anytime you allow it to go to the judges, they will see things in a certain way. But, um, you know, fair play to Hibamar, though. I mean, you know, his, he's been criticized for his strategy because Dante was the one pushing the pace, right? Mm -hmm. Hibamar was countering. Sure, you have to be uh, crafty against someone like Dante. You can't go in head first, uh, especially if that's not the way you play. It was a very strategic approach for, from Hibamar. You wanted to counterfight a little bit, and it paid off. I mean, it, sometimes it's not always going to be a spectacular submission victory. Sometimes you have to be strategic. And Hibamar clearly uh, felt comfortable out there. He wasn't shaken by any of the exchanges and it ended up with the win. So I wouldn't mind seeing these guys fight again. Um, I think both would make some adjustments to their game. But... I think neither left feeling particularly satisfied with the way that one went, went down. Yeah, it's pretty cool because uh, Fight to Win just announced today that uh, March 13th, they will be um, 
have well they're moving to austin they're going to be in austin for three events through march which is awesome because it's right here on our doorstep mm -hmm. can't wait for that but a uh, really cool match they just announced today is that hibamar is going to be taking on william tackett on love march that match. 13th love that match never fought before and i, I think uh tackett is is gonna just come out guns blazing as he does in every single match and I just can't believe both of you guys are based in Texas, and Tack has been taking black belt matches for a long time. They somehow haven't met, so that, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, but it also makes me wonder that, um, you know, had Dante won that match, whether he would have faced Tack mm. in this. <laughs> but Hibamar, of course, was the winner, so, you know, they, uh, they got that one set up. But it's pretty cool either way. We get to see those guys face off. Um, just one of the uh, result, really, that we want to mention from um, Fight to Win 164 is that Gabriel Souza, uh, another win over Gianni Grippo. Man, he um, seems to have Gianni's number. Yeah, you know, I think this comes down to Gianni Grippo really playing the same game in his matches. You can see him, in my opinion, at the very least, doesn't change uh, per venue. He fights the same way in IBJJF, Fight to Win. Wherever Gianni Grippo's fighting, you know what to expect. Gabriel Souza, on the other hand, he really modifies his game when he's on fight to win. You can see him really uh, abandoning position to attack on diving submissions, really, uh, really hyper aggressive there. And that's what, what succeeds at the fight to win stage. It's, uh, it's a different game than, than a points strategy. So I think that's a decisive factor. But um, it's not the only place where Gabriel Souza has beaten Johnny. So I No, he's beaten him now under IBJJF gi mm -hmm. and no gi and now fight to win submission only rules. And... Uh, you know, I feel like if, if Gianni, uh, he wants to stay relevant in the featherweight division, you know, he's going to need to maybe shake up his strategy somewhat because, of course, he has he has won very significant tournaments. He's a pan champion more than once. You know, he's a no-gi pan champion. He's a no-gi world champion. You know, he won the Kasai Pro super stacked 145-pound tournament back in 2018. But 2018 was the last time that we've really seen Gianni have a, um, a solid run of success. And I feel like, you know, whatever it is that he's doing, um, just don't think the results are coming like they used to. And I think that he should you know, really sort of step back and, and, and closely evaluate what he's doing and maybe necessary make some changes because you know it's like they say isn't it that uh was it the the madness is um doing the same thing over and over inspecting mm -hmm. different results right that is the phrase yeah it's to me it's not the jujitsu right that's not letting johnny down johnny has incredible jujitsu for sure extremely dedicated and, and amazing physical conditioning i mean there's nothing really missing on that end but like you said the results aren't quite coming the way they used to especially so. when you face off with you know new competitors right new faces on the scene now, I, I i have no doubt that gianni could go out and he could take out 85 90 percent of black belts easily you know in his division but of course you know the top 10 that that, that list is always in flux and there are always guys that on a certain day you can beat them on a certain day they'll beat you but you know if you've gone up against a guy three times in the last 12 months and you know you've lost all three times in in three different ways then, um, you know, and Gabriel Sosa is the perfect example as well of the sort of the next generation. You know, he's he's uh, been a black belt for about two years, whereas Gianni's been a black belt for seven or eight now at this point. You know, I think since 2013, something like that. So, you know, it's um it's definitely it's definitely time to kind of really sort of shake things up because you want to stay relevant. That's what you need to do. Right. Yeah. And, and maybe it could just simply be the case of, you know, Gianni's game ha it is very you could call it predictable. They know what he's going to do. They've yeah, had seven no years to watch yeah. him and study him. There's a lot of tapes, so many matches. You can watch a thousand Johnny Griffith matches on Flow Grappling. So you know what's coming. Maybe that's part of it. But Yeah. My, my Souza, I don't take anything away from him, though. We talked a lot about Johnny in this one. But Gabriel Souza, man, this guy, i got to say, if you don't know Gabriel Souza, you should really check him out. You really should. Because this guy, he is a 2019 Abu Dhabi World Pro Champion. That is by far his biggest career win. And that was a very, very significant. At... Uh, but, you know, he's just an exciting guy to watch as well. He's a scrapper. I yeah, like watching yeah. Souza. Sometimes in the featherweight division, there isn't uh, a lot of submission hunting, even especially in IBJJF. But Gabriel Souza really wants to finish every single match. He's really aggressive. He's not afraid to make things a little gritty, a little chippy out there. Yeah, he's, he's, I think he's a little bit underrated uh, on, on the major scene. But he's someone to watch and I think a major threat at featherweight for sure. 100%. Okay, so moving on to the performance of the week. So you should know by now what this segment is. Basically, uh, we like to take any kind of match that happens over the uh, over the weekend and uh, just you know, give a little bit of uh, a little bit of love to the winner, right? Because um, of course, there's so many big names out there doing big things in jujitsu, but of course, there's sometimes just the, you let the jujitsu do the talking. And I think that this is a perfect example, Pedro Veras. Let's play this clip because. 
he had a fantastic match against Rodrigo Lopez last weekend, right, Chase? Oh, yeah, this was, uh, we all came to the similar conclusion. We were watching this together, but independently we said, oh, man, this is this is a performance of the night unless something crazy happens later. And it was just nonstop attacks. So you see this diving back take, kind of Felipe Pena style right there. It was it was an incredible match. Pedro Veras is a, a Brazilian black belt, uh, from originally from the south of Brazil, uh, moved to Sao Paulo to go and train with the Cicero Costa team. So, uh, you know, obviously a very, very strong pedigree there. He's now currently based in Dallas, Texas at the Sharp and Iron Academy. Um, biggest win on his resume is he took bronze at the Europeans last year, 2020. Mm. And um, But you might not really know his name. He's not like a standout name. But if you look at his results, man, he is tough. He's really tough. He does very, very well. And I, I liked this match as well because especially fights win rules, you know, uh, people, they can open up a little bit more. We saw a little bit of everything, right? We saw some great guard passing, some really nice diving back takes, like you say. But for me, one of the best things about this match, Chase, I really like the way that he dealt with a lapel. Yeah, yeah, he never really got too tied down, and that, that I mean, that's hard to avoid with someone who's uh, really insistent on the lapel, but you're right, we saw a lot of great guard, a, a lot of diving attacks, as well as incredible top pressure, like right here, really full uh, game, and attacks from all areas and all angles, even a little jumping, leaping back take, Herbert Santos style. Yeah, that, it was a fun match. I really enjoyed it from start to finish. Now, here's the uh, the finishing sequence right here. A uh, very nice guard pass right there, just throwing the legs off to the side. Now, this choke, I still don't know the name of this choke. I've been doing jujitsu since 2002, and I still don't know the name of this choke. I do it all the time. I love it. It's a great choke. This amazing side control choke where you use your own lapel from top. Mm. I love it. If you have a name for it, let me know, because I feel bad that I don't have a name for this joke. But it's so cool, right? Uh, it's a great finish. Yeah, solid performance. Easily deserving performance of the week there from Pedro Veras, and I hope we see him back soon. Yeah, great performance indeed. So, all right, Chase. I know this is one of your uh, your favorite conversation starters. We need to talk about... Uh-oh. We're in trouble. <laughs> it's, it's not sinister or anything, right? But So this topic that we need to talk about actually doesn't stem from last week, Fight to Win 164, but the previous week, 163. Now, we would have talked about this last week on Grappling Bulletin, the show that got cancelled. But it is such a big topic. It's such an important thing to talk about mm. that, well, we brought it back and we had to talk about it today, right? We need to talk about... Slams in jujitsu. Oh boy, the great Strap in. debate. Yeah. So, um, well, I tell you, the first thing we should do, right, before we really get into our thoughts on slams, we should play this clip, right? Run it. Let's let's, it. let's take a look. This tank's getting empty. Maybe not, but slam, slam, and just some slobber flying straight out of Johnny Sosa's. Johnny Sosa is out. Is I think Johnny is? Sosa is out. I noticed he didn't move. He didn't move. He didn't defend. Yeah, he didn't respond. I think at Johnny all. Sosa is out. With his eyes open. Because once he slammed, the first thing I looked at was his face, and his eyes were open. Yeah, but he did slam, not move at all when Formiga jumped over. I think that slam knocked Johnny Sosa out. Okay, so first of all, we should point out that this is not a shot at Formiga or anything like that. Absolutely Formiga not. Formiga is one of the nicest gentlemen in the game. No malicious intent there. But the, the results are undeniable. I mean, that was pretty brutal, Hal. Yeah, absolutely. It is brutal. And and the problem is that uh, this, this clip, we posted it on our Instagram during the show, actually. And it kick-started a huge, fierce debate with the vast majority of people basically saying that they didn't like it. Right? I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can go and look for yourself. It's still there. But... There, I see both sides of it, right? I, I like the fact that as a professional show where competitors are giving every tool in their arsenal to win a match, that is, I think, um, a good thing, right? Like for a long time when the IBJJF didn't allow heel hooks. People complained. People complained saying that's one of my major weapons. Now, are slams one of people's major weapons? No, but it is an attack, so why limit it? Now, thankfully... As far as fight to win is concerned, there's been no, as far as I know, uh, serious debilitating injuries from this. There have been some, some uh, maybe concussions, which are serious. They racked those up, but no one's broken their their back or anything like that, or no neck injuries. So, 
it's been okay, but it's very scary as, as someone who... All I, right, so it is scary, yeah. but it, it's a very polarizing topic, right? The, the majority of people you write, they will come out and they'll say that, it, number one, it's not technical. Number two, mm -hmm. that is dangerous. And the other thing that they, they most often cite is that it is just a bad look for the sport. Mm. So let's break it down. Let's go for the first one. Do you think a slam is a technical move? Uh, I think in the streets, this could be the right technique. I mean, if, if a guy's hanging off of you, that would hurt him. Technically speaking, yes. I feel but do I that. Think, <laughs> I, I'm not, maybe I'm dancing around. No, it's not very technical. But okay, I think technically, I think it yeah. is, right? Because, oh. you know, well, the number one, try picking somebody up who doesn't want to be picked up. They do it all the time in close guard. They do, but they let themselves be picked up. Mm. Try picking somebody up who doesn't want to be picked up. What are they going to do? They're going to hook the ankle. They're going to grab your pants. You won't be able to get that person off the ground. Johnny, in this case, Johnny Souza, the mm -hmm. guy who got knocked out, mm. forgot maybe that slams were legal in this mm. rule format. And he just like came three, four feet up off the ground, allowing for me to dive his full combined weight forward into a slam. That's a lot of weight, you know? So technically, I feel that it was maybe a reminder that if you are on bottom, you shouldn't let somebody pick you up and you should have the right technical answer for that. It's not like there's no defense for it. Mm. I mean, Once you're on your way down, there's no defense. That's but. true. I mean, that's definitely one of the first things I learned as a white belt. If you get picked up, hook the leg, open your legs, don't get carried. Open your legs. There it's, you go. There's another yeah. very easy defense. Right I feel there. like it's yeah. only as you progress through th and compete a lot where you start maybe trying to climb up for attacks and you feel much more comfortable because you're- One might say bad habits. One could say. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, okay, there is some technique to it, but I don't think it's a great look. I don't know. Okay, so there's the next thing. All right, well, we'll come to that in a second. Number one. Number two, dangerous. The, 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 Undeniably the possibility, dangerous. <laughs> possibility for injury. Well, the fact that this isn't the first yeah. knockout by slam on the fight to win stage. But the thing is, the fight to win stage is sprung. Yes. There's quite a yes. lot of... No, you, I've never competed. I've walked across it, but you've competed on the fight to win stage. What mm -hmm. does it feel like? Uh, it's, there's a lot of give. It's kind of bouncy. Um, it's definitely... You would have a you would have a much more devastating effect if the match were simply on the ground. Uh, like in the a, gym. On, like on the gym. That would really really be much more uh, devastating much nastier there's a significant amount of balance if you guys ever trained like on on an octagon or like an mma cage that usually they have some floorboards some springs and stuff like that uh it is a, a difference maker for sure and you can hear it you can definitely hear that that kind of bouncing sound it was a big old yeah. bang yeah. yeah that's for sure um and then there's the other thing is the uh is the optics of it. How does it look? Is it good for jujitsu to see somebody get knocked out? Because the fact is that jujitsu, while um, while it's not MMA, people are not watching jujitsu to see people get knocked out. Mm. People are watching jujitsu and there's the very real possibility you could see somebody's arm get snapped or see somebody's leg get broken mm -hmm. or see somebody get choked unconscious. So is there much different to a serious injury via a slam or a knockout via a slam, which is maybe serious, not serious, compared to a, a potentially serious injury on somebody's limb. Is there much difference? Uh, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about traumatic traumatic head injuries, concussive injuries. Those, in my opinion, you know, I'm not a medical expert, but are significantly worse, right? I mean, I would rather have my elbow hyperextended than uh, sustain a concussion. Lose the memories from your seventh birthday party? <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, maybe those can be left behind. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think head injuries are... Uh, pretty clearly a worse thing to uh, incur. And that's one of the beauties of jiu-jitsu is that you can fight every weekend. You don't see other combat sports with strikes doing that because, uh, it, well, it's much harder to keep up. You can't keep that work rate if you get punched in the face every weekend. So That is very true. Uh, man, so about the image of it, I'm, um, I'm in two minds. I feel that there is little difference between the slam compared to, let's say, a big massive suplex or a huge judo throw where the guy gets thrown at great mm -hmm. speed and impacts the mat. And you see some people landing on their heads in those kind of instances, you know? It's true, yes. Where the difference between picking somebody up and dropping them down from the guard, the slam is, you know, the kind of the same thing, really. But I will agree that in terms of, like, the look, in terms of the optics, I'm not sure how I feel about 
somebody knocking somebody out on purpose in jujitsu as opposed to a uh, gradual progression or a uh, you know a, a technical attack that led to a submission hold a finishing hold because the one thing of course the difference between a slam and a submission hold it was with a submission hold you can tap early Sure. You feel you're in danger. You feel your arm can be 98% hyperextended and you can tap out before it gets right to that breaking point. With a leg lock, you feel that your leg is in danger. You know that it's about to tap. Think about Mateus Denise versus Gordon Ryan, you know? Mm. That Gordon had him in, like, checkmate. And he didn't even need to rotate and extend, you know, to, to hyperextend the knee. Well, Mateus knew he was done. He tapped. There was, like, nobody went away with any injuries in that match. With a slam, now the split second that you have from here to here, you don't have a lot of time to defend or to protect yourself against that. And once it's in motion, it's in motion. You got no say about it, right? So mm. it's a, it's a it's a definitely a tricky one. Personally, I'm not against slams in fight to win. I know that maybe you're a little bit different, but I feel that as you said earlier, it's a reminder that jujitsu was made for fighting. That jujitsu is a martial art, a combat sport, and that it should have practicality in various arenas. Now, that applies to, let's say, mixed martial arts, self defense, or sport jujitsu. Now, sport jujitsu has become watered down over time to make it a safe you know, uh, sport for practitioners by removing the most dangerous elements. Fight to Win is a professional jujitsu event. It's a very bold claim to say so confidently. Jujitsu has been watered down. That's a a full-on discussion i feel like but go on it is but the argument is clear even mm -hmm. the even the, the powers that be know that that's why they brought heel hooks back because they were afraid of jujitsu becoming watered down and not becoming as effective as it used to be so if heel hooks are being brought back in and slams have been introduced by fight to win a while ago to keep things real mm. then maybe it's a reminder that if you're not training with those things in mind then your jujitsu it's maybe not quite up to scratch but in terms of the technique not everybody needs to practice slams because unless you're going to go and compete on a fight to win, you shouldn't be slamming each other in the game. God, I hope, I hope that doesn't become very common. Right? I don't think it will. But uh, they are here to stay, you know, unless something really changes. You know, Seth's been very clear that slams are a part of the format and it would be a big reversal and I don't think we're going to see that. So... I say, I say let them stay. Man. Professional mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu is not the same as an open tournament. It's not the same as everyday training. I say, I say keep them in. There you go. Not up to us, though. Not, <laughs> not, not, not on this us. one. And, uh, yeah. Let's move right along here. Slams. That's a lot of talk <laughs> about slams. Up about slams. Uh, it's a great debate. It's a big debate. It is a big debate, and it's definitely got people riled up. But, uh, yeah, there we go. Slams. There you have it. So we have a lot of upcoming events uh, this weekend. You may be aware... We've got another who's number one, Craig Jones versus Ronaldo Jr. in the main event. Really? I hadn't heard. <laughs> who's number one? It's back. It's back on Friday. And we go. Uh, co main, not even at the main spot. We have Gordon Ryan versus Roberto Jimenez. Now, this is because uh, Craig claimed it first. Craig was the original, you know, headlining act. Nikki Ryan had to pull out, unfortunately, due to injury. Gordon stepped in late notice. <laughs> the whole thing was pretty freaking crazy if you think about it. But, yeah, man, I'm excited. This would be an, an incredible card, Hal. Yeah, I mean, this is phenomenal, right? I was already excited for Craig versus Ronaldo Jr., Atos versus Danaher Death Squad. Mm. You, Ronaldo Jr., the human highlight reel, going up against Australia's deadliest mammal in <laughs> Craig Jones. But... The fact that originally we had Nicky Ryan versus Roberto Jimenez, some were even saying that they were more excited for that match than they were for Craig versus Roberto. Personally, I'm equally excited for all of them. But then Nicky gets injured and Gordon slides in instead. And you, suddenly you've just got this monster match in the co-main event because Gordon doesn't take away any, he doesn't want to take away any shine from, from Craig, who was already right there in the main event, which is phenomenal. But it's a stacked card, right? Who else we got on the show, Craig? We got Gabby Garcia versus Naturally the Jesus. That's a, that's a kind of a rubber match. They have some history going back. Back and forth. Really excited to see that one plays out. Gio Martinez is back versus Edwin Junior Ocasio. Great, great match there. Some uh, what is that at? 145, 155? 145. 145, yes. yeah, because Junior's probably uh, lighter than 155 all the time. Andrew Wilsey from Daisy Fresh is on, taking on PJ Barch of 10th Planet. Great match. That's a that's maybe the underground match of the night. People, people in the know will the 
understand that there's just well, going to be nonstop action there. Man, Andrew's like kind of like a household name in jiu-jitsu now, right? Because of the, course, Daisy the Fresh success event. of the Daisy yes. Fresh series. And uh, and he is. He's an amazing competitor. He took the, the gold medal at the IBJJF Nogi Pans uh, uh, late last year and uh, had some standout matches since getting his black belt in, uh, in 2020. And, um, of course, you know, PJ Barch is, for me, one of the most underrated Nogi grapplers on the scene. This guy is great. He is a Kasai veteran. He's an ADCC trials veteran. He's a very, very capable grappler with a very different style to what you usually see from the 10th planet. Because 10th planet, you usually think of, you know, funky guard. You see the twister, the truck. You see rubber guard. You see a lot of leg locks nowadays from those guys as well. PJ is like, uh-uh. PJ is like in your face, scrambly, great, great, rest, great wrestling, wrestling background. Yeah. Exactly. So, really breaks the mold when it comes to what you think of the average 10th planet fighter and i think that these two guys match up really well we also are going to have some prelims free on youtube and i believe facebook that includes uh, jessica making her debut against daniel kelly also making her who's number one debut and then kicking things off for us we're going to have jacob the hillbilly hammer couch versus elder el monstro cruz that is insane. There's a lot of heat behind this match, Hal. Yeah, I know, right? Two purple belts, and uh, these guys have been going back and forth, competed last year, and uh, yeah, there's definitely there's some heat there. You know, you got Daisy Fresh versus Checkmat, and uh, I'm sure that you know, these guys will rise to the occasion because opening a show like that, a lot of responsibility. You gotta, you gotta live up to the hype, you know. So it'll be a lot of fun. And don't forget as well that the day after here live on Flow Grappling. Uh, February 27th, you got Fight to Win 165. You got Maria Maui Jacek up against Elizabeth Clay. In the gi. In the gi. Fantastic. Chicks. Fantastic. What's up with that? Uh, I don't know what's up, but I like it. You know, it's been a long time <laughs> since we've seen Liz Clay uh, in the gi. This will be, I believe, her black belt debut in the gi. And uh, taking on a very, very dangerous Maria Maui Jacek. She recently submitted Natchelli De Jesus with a knee bar not that long ago. Uh, Maria is also an ADCC uh, veteran herself. She's may not be uh, super well known like Liz Clay, but she's every bit as dangerous and a, a tough challenge for someone who's been out of the gi for quite a while. How? We yeah, a very big challenge. I gotta say, I'm I'm really excited to see that. Uh, I just want to address some of the comments from our live chat here on uh, on YouTube. So mm. uh, a very uh, very good question is that when are the new gi rankings coming out? Because things have been shaken up lately with Gutenberg and Penner from BJJ Stars. Fair question. Tournament. Fair question. The answer is they're coming very soon. The answer is we've been so busy, and of course we lost power for a good chunk of last week as well. Yeah, last week that, probably would have when they've been done, but yeah. I imagine. Next week, we'll have a, a better handle on that, if not the week after. They're in the works. We're very well aware that they're overdue for an update, so we'll get those key rankings updated as soon as we can. And, uh, yeah, I got a, a great comment here as well about how everybody's writing off Roberto, Chase. Yeah. That, think about that. I, well, it's it's hard to bet against Gordon. You know, it doesn't <laughs> yes. matter if you're Roberto or not in this case. It's do you want to bet against Gordon? I think Roberto poses a, a serious threat to Gordon. I'll tell you why. When Gordon moved up in weight, when he, when he put on a lot of muscle – he suddenly didn't have to deal with the athleticism present at 88 kilograms. And Gordon has openly said he's not much of an athlete. He's much more methodical and about control and slowly working towards position. And you saw it was a little bit potentially tougher to control some of these more agile, nimble players that are not present in those heavier weight classes. Roberto brings that to this match. Yeah. He is athletic as they come. He's extremely opportunistic and uh, always looking to win a scramble. I'm not going to say he's the favorite, but I think Roberto... He's definitely not the favorite. <laughs> I mean, let's be I honest. I the won't, betting I won't lines go... came out, yeah. and Gordon is a minus 1250 favorite. Hey, that's a that's a good bet you know, uh, to, for Roberto. <laughs> you bet $1,250 to win 100 Yeah, no, no, no. that's pretty I'm crazy. talking about Roberto here. I mean, <laughs> Roberto could R shock Roberto the world. Roberto is a plus 675 underdog. That is a... Big, big spread. If you're a betting there. man, there's some money to be made potentially on Roberto, but I will say the odds are leaning towards Gordon here. Of course, Roberto has. A little disclaimer, we don't encourage illegal gambling, but please check the laws in your jurisdiction. Yes, thank you, Hal, for all that. Um, you know, Go Gordon it, it is a hard riddle to solve. So He is, but... I'm intrigued to see how it's going to go because, yeah, okay, That's you know, you might That's imagine, <laughs> yeah, you might imagine that it's a foregone conclusion, and it is very hard to bet against the number one pound for pound no gi grappler in the world, of course. But 
it's for me it's intriguing how is this match going to go i don't think it'll be as quick as maybe the craig jones versus roberto match will be mm. you know gordon's not that kind of guy he doesn't go out and tap people out in a minute it's a 30 minute match as well he won't go out there and just try to submit roberto as quick as he can he always says this right he wants guys to do jujitsu with him mm -hmm. and he feels that roberto he respects roberto because of this because he feels that roberto is going to come at him that he's going to make him do jujitsu. He's going to try and get his back. He's going to try and choke him rather than just try and stay on the edge, stall him out and try and win a decision like he feels that many of his opponents try to do. Because with Gordon, surviving the distance is akin to a victory. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, can't blame people for, for adopting that mindset. Let's not forget that Roberto has spent some time training with Gordon. You know, we have... I I don't know if we have video on the site, but he was spotted in the basement a couple I years ago. I think we do. We actually, might actually have yeah. some video from a couple years ago. So obviously, techniques have evolved. These guys have evolved, but uh, there is some familiarity there on the mats, and that always changes things too. So I, I, I'm really, really excited for this match, and I do think Roberto brings an interesting challenge to Gordon that he hasn't seen in a while, which is uh, just the uh, elite level movement and laser back attacks. Can't wait! Absolutely can't wait. So that all goes down this Friday, February 26th. What time do matches start, Hal? After 7, 7 o'clock? Uh, 10 p.m. start for the live show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we've got those two free matches on uh, Facebook and YouTube. And then the full show will kick off after those two matches. And then, yeah, it should be a very exciting night. So who's number one on Friday, February 26th? Fight to win on February 27th, Saturday. Next week, another episode of Grappling Bulletin. We'll see you then. My name is Ronaldo Jr. I'm from Brazil. I train at Atos Jiu Jitsu in San Diego. My name is Craig Jones. I train with Henzo Gracie Academy, specifically the Danaher Death Squad. Uh, my style is kind of aggressive. I think it's going to be a very exciting match for the people who love Jiu Jitsu. Typically, a lot of people will watch me compete to see the finishes. And in regards to those finishes, mostly heel hooks. Uh, now is my time. I'm excited. For sure, it's going to be exciting.